morning I'm going to review kind of where we've been the last couple weeks and then as I do I want to add some things into it. I feel like God's sort of been maybe magnifying my attention as I've gone back over that and adding. Um, first of all, let's begin uh, the verse of the month, January, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, I keep thinking I'm going to get to that Sunday where I actually teach on this verse a lot, <laughs> and I keep finding God's adding to the current thing so much, so who knows, maybe we'll roll this one into February too, but um, this is so powerful. Someone came up to me recently and said, you know, this concept is one of those verses that changed their lives. They gave themselves to Christ and then spent the next six years of their Christian life trying to crucify their flesh, only to one day read these verses and realize it was done with Christ on the cross. You know, it, we are not who we were. Christ nailed, we were co-crucified, we were with him. We are new creations, and yes, we have our old body of flesh, and yes, we have temptation, but we have Christ's life in us, leading us in a path of victory. And that is why I believe the Bible can say with confidence, there is no temptation too great. But in Christ, He does not provide us a way out. Um, I believe He has given us victory over sin. Sin no longer holds power over us. It may hold temptation. And Lord, but remember temptation. Jesus was tempted, and that's not sin. And Christ gives us the power to say no. And this is just something, just let this verse just marinate in you. It is Christ's life in you as you join with Him in faith. As you trust, as you let His life live through you. It's You're not who you used to be. And it may feel like it. Yeah, praise God. It may feel like it. You know, it... it I still have the same temptations, I still have the same things that pull at me, but who I am, they know, I now have an option. Before I did not have an option. I was a slave to my flesh, I was under the dominion of darkness, but as a new creation in Christ, the Bible says in Colossians, He took me from the authority or the rule of darkness and put me into the kingdom of His Son, the authority of Christ. I am a different person. You know, it'd be, it's like you trying to fight a battle one way, then someone takes you, trains you, equips you with all these super weapons, gives you a Delta Force team to accompany you, and now sends you back. You're not that same person. And the, the whole game's changed. And that's the heart of this. Um, and then, so we've been looking for some months now at how is things God has promised us, and I'm moving past the verse of the month. Don't, don't try to figure out what this has to do with that. Uh, although that has a lot to do with it. It's a promise of God. But when God has promised us something, or told us something is true, or right, or whatever, we as Christians don't need to just hope. Though we maybe don't see that, so there's still hope in the sense that we maybe haven't seen or apprehended what he has promised. We can be assured of it with a, a, a biblical certainty because it is God who has promised it. And whereas the world hopes something, maybe, you know, well, I hope so. Um, with God, when it's something he has told us, you know, we looked at that with Sarah last week, and I'll touch on that again in a little bit, but... You know, at first, like, me, a baby, yeah, right, that would be nice, I hope, you know. But and then somewhere in there she goes, wait a minute, God promised this to me. I am going to have a baby. And did she still have that? Had she conceived yet? No. So technically it's still hope, but it's an assured hope because her faith has joined with the promise of God. And so we've been looking at those. There's promises God's given us that are ours now as a Christian. Uh, you're saved, God is with us, we have eternity with Him, nothing can separate us from His love. He works all things together for good in our lives as we are called according to His purpose. You know, there's a few of the now promises. We have future promises that aren't yet. When Satan will be cast down, a new heaven and a new earth. Everything done in darkness will be brought to light. All lies will be exposed to truth. Um, all that is coming. 
But we can know it's coming, not hope it's coming. I hope one day good wins. You know, I hope Satan gets his come up and says, no, he will, because God has told us this. And so it is a hope, because it's not yet, but it's an assured hope. And then lately we have been talking about now promises, but maybe we don't grasp or apprehend for different reasons. Uh, maybe our faith hasn't met that promise yet. Or maybe that is dependent on other people in our lives also doing what God's called them to do or be. And so we're being held back like Joshua and Caleb were from the promise that was supposed to be theirs then. And, and I'll talk, go back to all of that. We talked about that last week. But that's kind of where we're at. And one of the, the big things that we've been emphasizing is the big picture. Knowing that big picture is what gives perspective to our moments. You know, yes, you're in a very rough season right now. Yes, things are scary. Yes, things... And nothing diminishes that in the sense of saying, oh, just get over it or move on or anything like that. Jesus wept. Jesus had tremendous compassion. Jesus walked. He understands. But he also knew the big picture. Remember Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. For what he knew was coming, it carried him through the pain of the moment. And God gives us this big picture. He says, there is coming a day. There is coming a day when good wins, when, you know, and all these things I just went over. And, and it, it, you know, the example I've used the last couple of weeks, we're in that single frame, whatever you're in right now is that single frame or paragraph or chapter of the movie or book. But your true life is that film strip laid out with no end. There, you know, there's no time the credits roll and it says the end. You have eternity with God, your creator. And this big picture really can help things stay in perspective. Um, it could be a picture of, yes, this is horrible right now, but this is a moment of my eternal life. Or this seems overwhelming, but then when I remember who God is and lay this against God, it's not so overwhelming. You know, in, in that perspective, you know, it's... I got an expression I've always laughed at, um, the girls have heard a hundred times, but it's like, you know, the difference between the England and the United States is England thinks a hundred miles is a long distance and we think a hundred years is a long time. And, you know, but it's, it's, it is, I looked it up this morning and you could put almost two UKs into California alone. You know, so for us, you know, a little road, road trip or something, you know, for, I mean, we go up to my mom's, it's 100 miles one way back, you know. You, that's a major drive if you're in England. That's like, you know, I mean, it's like, whoa, you know, 100 mile trip, you know. But we walk around and go, look at that, it's an antique. That's from the 50s. And they got buildings that go back to Christ, you know. I mean, it's like, you know, it, it, there's this perspective. It, it, it your framework puts it all in perspective. You know, they would come here and look at our road trips and kind of go, whoa, you know. And, and, you know, but then they would walk in our antique stores and probably burst out laughing. And it's all perspective. It's all what you've seen, what you're used to. I remember my friend from Nebraska flew out for our wedding and and he walked and went to a grocery store with us and we entered on the side of the store where the meat department was and he kind of looks at the meat department and goes, you call that a meat department? Ah, you know, and starts getting all this cocky thing. We walk around the corner to the produce and he's like, oh, you know, and it was, it's just all your perspective. I, um, one time it was a, a friend of mine took me back when I was at West Point, took me to Bunker Hill, Breeds Hill in Boston. You know, and you've heard about the Battle of Bunker Hill and don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. Anyway, come around the corner and it's like, where, well, it's right there. And then me and my infinite wisdom and filters blurt out, that's not a hill, that's a bump. And, you know, <laughs> and, and it, it didn't work out so well. But, um, you know, it was the same when Marianne and I went to Little Bighorn and you just, as you read about Custer's Last Stand, you picture this, you know, Especially from California, right? What 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 is a, a hill to us is a mountain to so many people. 
you know, my friend in Nebraska, when he took us by this little bump in the prairie and told us that was a major landmark for wagon trains and everything, and you're kind of going, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's all perspective. And, and that's, the, the, you know, these are funny stories, but the point is, if we can get a glimpse of who our God is and what eternity is, we can then lay what we're seeing in the moment against those pictures and gain that perspective. And, and I think that that is what is so important for us uh, to kind of remember. You know, Isaiah if you read Isaiah chapter 6, when he has his vision in the temple, I, and I was just thinking about this, actually, one of the songs uh, this morning, and it made me just run up here and add it to my notes. You know, Isaiah's cruising along, doing whatever Isaiah did, and then, boom, you hit Isaiah chapter 6, and he has a vision of God in the temple. And instantly, any pretense Isaiah had of his own goodness or anything laid against this vision of the holiness of God, what does it say? It's Isaiah falls flat down on his face and just cries, I'm done. Woe is me. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Basically, we're toast. What happened? He got a glimpse of the holiness of God. And suddenly, what he thought was his goodness is I'm doing all right or whatever. I'm not trying to put thoughts in his head. It doesn't really say, I don't believe, what he thought of himself before that. All it says is he got a glimpse of God seated in his throne. And boom, he's on the ground just going, it's over. And then, of course, the beautiful redemptive of the coal from the altars touching his lips. And I mean, it's an amazing chapter in the Bible. But, but again, it's perspective. And so that big... That big picture is something, the big, the full picture is something to keep in mind as we return to the spies in a couple minutes that, that went into the river we talked about last week. Keep this in mind. All 12 spies saw the same thing. It wasn't that the 10 went over one ridge and saw the giants in the fortified cities while Joshua and Caleb were over here napping. All 12 saw the same thing. And I know that's not 12. Um, uh, saw the same thing, right? They come back. 10 choose to let that be all they saw. 2 choose to see the bigger picture. And to say, no, if God is with us, and God delights in us, and God has promised us, yeah, they're big, yeah, that's fortified, but that land is ours. Their favor, their protection has left them. But all 12 saw the same thing. And this is why I think the world often does not get what God intends it to get through Christians. Because we all turn on the news, we all face the bills, we all have the doctor's reports, and too often I think Christians don't respond a whole lot differently than the world but we should. Because what do we say? We say we have the creator of the universe who breathes out stars, who dwells within us. His Holy Spirit is within us. And we have the picture of eternity. And we know the God who breathes out stars from his words. And I'm not saying we don't have tears. I'm not saying we don't have that initial, we've got to start to wrestle it captive. I'm not saying our problems are really trivial. I'm not saying any of that. But I am saying at some point, we're supposed to be Joshua and Caleb. Because I really believe that promised land is not just heaven, but it's the life we are promised. A life where we can walk in an abundance of joy and peace and victory over our enemies. I believe that is something God is, uh, desires us to walk in, but it is only entered into by faith, which sees a bigger picture and a bigger God and applies it to the obstacles. When the world comes up against an obstacle, what do they have? They have, I hope so. They have a world's hope. And they have their own resources. When we come up against an obstacle, what do we have? We have our resources, but more importantly, 
We have our Creator who says, I dwell within you and I love you and I made you and I work all things to good and greater am I who is in you than he who paces about like a roaring lion seeking to devour you. I have given you mighty weapons for demolishing strongholds of darkness. I love you. I have adopted you. You are my child. You reign in my courts. You are seated in heaven with me. You are a holy one, set apart for me, by me, unto me. You are mine, and I am yours. And we bring that to bear against what we face. And, you know, those of you who know me know I battle anxiety, I worry a lot, I'm always what if I, I get that. I wish I was a better example for you guys. I know I've come a long way, though. And I just continue to take captive and try and do my best. And, you know, to know what is true and to, to walk this. But God is the creator. We are the creative. And that God says, I am for you, not against you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Whatever you walk through as you walk in my spirit, we will walk through together. And that changes everything. Notice Joshua and Caleb didn't say, you know, no, nope, we're just going to go, Alibaba, and the land will be ours. They said, no, we need to go and still occupy. We are going to have to engage in combat. We do have work to do. But God with us, delighting in us, that land is ours. That's the Christian life. Leaving my notes right now, what just comes to my mind as I stare at Goliath, and, and many of you understand because I use this example, but what happens? David comes to bring stuff to his brothers. There's this giant, nine foot six at least tall, glittering in armor, a shield bearer carrying the stuff, 30 pound spear tip. And all the warriors of Israel, including the king himself, are trembling in their boots. And this Goliath, this Philistine, is taunting the people of God. And David's just indignant. He's like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine taunting the armies of the living God? Will no one go up and face him? And what was it? They, what was Goliath suggesting? A one-on-one, -on -one, right? Mono a mono, or whatever that expression is, right? Whoever wins. Everyone else gets the fruit of the victory of one of us. Whoever wins. So David, from whom the line of David, Jesus comes, is an inheritor, the throne of endures forever, as promised her. David says, I will step up. And we know the story, the sling and the stones and all that. Goliath falls. David cuts off his head with Goliath's own sword, picks up the head. The army of the Philistines tremble. The army of Israel is emboldened behind the faith and victory of one man. And they charge forward, and the army of Philistines is driven from the land, and the army of Israel comes back and plunders the enemy's goods. We have our David. God has gone forth. He has taken us from the authority of darkness. He has driven back. And it is now for us to follow behind him and to plunder the enemy's camps, to start to see Marriages restored, addictions falling, the lost coming to the, the light. Um, to see these things happen, to see sickness fall away, to see, is it a battle, is it a war? Absolutely. Are there casualties? Yes, there are. But if God is with us and delights in us, and he has promised us, we come behind the victory of Christ, the army of the living God. And this is just this, this, Package, this big picture, this thing that we can't lose sight of. And you know, we talked about like Sarah who had this doubt, who had this laughter, and then Hebrews 11 tells us at some point she, she took that doubt or laughter captive to the one who had promised and said, wait a minute, this is God that has promised this. I'm going to have a baby. And this, this faith, what is our faith? Our faith is not just believing God exists. The Bible says... And guys, you'll read this in James. Even the demons believe and tremble. 
It's not just a belief in existence. Faith is a commitment of a life into that belief. It is a trust into it. It is allowing God to move and live in and through us. Adrian Thomas calls it, it's, it's letting God, as he puts it. Um, I mean, God can do anything he wants, but God is a respecter of our free will. Faith says, go ahead, God. I trust you. Here I am. Your life lived through mine. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved himself and gave himself for me. That is faith. That is what it is. And I, I read, I read or I listened, I think, I, I was trying so hard to remember where I heard this or read it, and I, I can't, and it bothers me, so I want to give credit where it's due. I think I was listening to an audio teaching by Major Ian Thomas. I'm not sure. But somewhere in it, he made the statement, I don't know if he was talking about himself or a man he knew who said this, so anyway, all that being said. The statement was made, don't ever tell me, oh, you're a man of such great faith. He said, that's an insult to God. And I remember going, huh? This doesn't make any sense. But then I started thinking about it, and I started listening. And the point he was trying to make is, it should actually take very little faith to trust God. Because God is so trustworthy, and so mighty, and so great. And he used the example, he said, someone asks me, you know, do you travel much? Yes, you know, how long sometimes? Oh, sometimes I'm out of country for three months. Does your wife go with you? No, she doesn't. She stays back at home. Wow, you've got a lot of faith in your wife. He goes, huh, do you receive that as a compliment about your faith or an insult against your wife? It's an insult against the wife. Why shouldn't he trust her? Why should it take great faith to trust his wife while he's not at home. What does that say about the wife? But yet we go, wow, you have such great faith in God to the ones that step out, the ones that, you know, and I know the point of that compliment. I'm not, don't, don't get nitty gritty. But the point of his comment, though, really gave me pause to think. When I start to consider who my God is, and his trustworthiness, and the love he showed poured out upon a cross, his presence with me, his power. When I start to think about that, he should be the one in my life who I need the least faith to trust and follow. You know, and, and if we start to think, carry this forward, and, and I'm sure we can shoot holes in this thing too, but you know, the, the point, you carry it forward a little, you think in your life, the ones that you've come to know and trust and found reliable and everything, do you exercise great faith to trust them? No. It's the ones who maybe aren't reliable and have let you down and don't really have maybe the capacity to do what they promise. Those are the ones, if you choose to trust them, you're taking a big step of faith, right? And, and the way this was worded, it really, it really spoke to me. You know, and again, it took me back to Sarah. She considered him faithful who had promised. You know, in the natural, what was promised her was something just beyond human realm. I mean, Abraham's 100, she's 90, you know, whatever. And I know it was a little before that point, but it's like, it's... But then she considered him faithful who had promised. She's like, hmm. He's more trustworthy than all the science, all the experiences of life all the, uh, you know, well-intended voices of people around me. He's God. He's the creator. I the creator. And it really, I don't know, I just, I wanted to throw that out to you kind of as a, a, a point of thought, you know, to think about. Because I think it, it, it really awakened me, and I'm sure down the road, I will talk about heroes of the faith and go, oh, this person had great faith. But let, it, let the little nudge come back. And remember this point, though. Really, it is God of whom the least faith should be required. And when you think about that, what does Jesus say? You have faith the size of a mustard seed. Yeah. What is possible to you as a child of God? That's encouraging. 
You know, he's not asking for us to have gargantuan faith. Just trust. Let me. Let me. And see what happens. You know, and it's just an exciting thought. I don't know, for me anyway. Um, and so then we, we moved into the spies, the whole story. So we saw how Abraham was promised the land by God, and God did so by covenant. And we talked about the animals were split in half, the blood flowed between them, and God passed. God alone, not a covenant of two. Abraham did not have to make his promise to God. God said, this is simply my promise to you. And you will enter, your people will enter by faith into this covenant. That was our role. The Abraham's people's role was faith for the covenant of that land. We see this come with Joshua and Caleb. We see the fulfillment. The land was theirs. It was ready. God said, I'm leading you into it. And what was required was the people to choose faith and to cross the river and occupy. And so we see this. This is important because we ourselves are in a covenant sealed by blood. Jesus was the final sacrifice. He died and his blood poured out. And again, it is a one-person covenant. It's all God's doing. Which is really nice because it doesn't depend on our, I'm a great Christian this week and I really blew it this week. There's one thing that seals us and we receive the inheritance of that covenant, the promise of God, and that is our faith that joins Covenant is a sacred word to God. In this day and age, it means so little to so many. You know, we enter into agreements, be it whatever, marriage or legal or whatever, and even when we've signed a legal agreement, what if people half the time seem to want to do? Find a lawyer to find a way out, a loophole. You know, I know it's romanticized. It's probably one of the reasons I've always loved the Louis L'Amour Westerns because a man, you know, his word was his handshake and that was it, you know. And if you called a man a liar, you stepped in the street and drew guns. Why? Because your business was conducted on your word and if you gained a reputation as a liar, you couldn't do business. It was done. You know, they didn't have lawyers on every corner drawing up triplicates and having a second lawyer check it to make sure they didn't miss anything and yada yada. You just, and, and I know, like I said, this is romanticized, I know this, but, but there's something that hearkens in us to a day when your word is your word. The Bible tells us of God that it is impossible for him to lie. When God gives us his word, it is his word. And it's as good as done. Now again, as we've been studying and looking at different promises of God, we need to know context, conditions. They're not blank checks to go live any way you want. Many of his promises are for specific moments or postures of heart or things, but knowing them. And his covenant of salvation, his presence with us, it is based upon our faith. Remember, the people of Israel, like, of Israel, they were losers. I mean, they are, he parts an ocean, he delivers them from Egypt, he protects them from plagues, he does all this stuff, he wipes out Egyptian armies, and they are just moaning and groaning and complaining and ungrateful and faithless and everything else, and he is still prepared to give them that land because he said he would. That's the way God does covenant. No, I told you I would. This is dependent on my word, not your performance. So now the law was a covenant based. You want to try that? You want to try the old covenant? Okay, here's my standard of holiness. You live up to it, and we're good. Kumbaya. And we find out we can't. And so, so God says, okay, I'll give you a covenant that only depends on me. But there's a payment for sin and it's death. So I'll hang on that cross for you. And he did. And he bled out his life for you and I. And the Bible says when we observe that, when we do communion, this is my blood, the new covenant poured out for you. It's the remembrance of this covenant that depends on him, that we join by faith. 
And so this is where it's really important because as we start to look at God's promises in our life, we start to see God is a God who keeps His word. Covenant is broken only by death. The penalty of breaking covenant is death. Jesus died for a covenant. Because we broke one. We didn't keep the law. So we see this, that this was promised by covenant to Abraham. We saw last week that he promised it again to Moses when he called him before the burning bush. I've heard the cry of my people. I'm going to lead you out and take you to the land. He reiterated it again when Moses, he told Moses, I'm leading you in, but I am not going with you. I'm sick of these people. They're grumbling. I'll send an angel ahead and he'll, he'll give you the land. And Moses says, no, Lord, how did the world know that we are distinct but by your presence with us? which we talked last week. That is the mark of a Christian, is God with us. Is the very nature of our salvation is God with us. That is salvation. And that's why your salvation begins at the moment of your conversion, not someday in heaven. That's what it's all about. Heaven is just a different location. God is the prize. You and Him join back together. And so this is, what is what's happened so he promises them. Moses says, no, Lord, please, if you're not going with us, don't send us. God said, all right, Moses, you know, basically, I love you, man. I'll go with you. And so they get to the river. God says, send in the spies, because God wants us to know what we're up against, because that's when faith kicks in. You know, as I said last week, you stumble into a situation, like, well, I better make the best of it. But you know what you're getting into before you step forward. That's faith. That's saying, I trust you. Two spies come back, ten, ten speak doom and gloom, and two um, speak hope and faith. And that's where we pick up Numbers 14, 1 through 4. All the congregation raised a, rap, raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night, and all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So this is the response of the people. This is I have Joshua and Caleb encouraging them, trying to point them back to the promise, point them to the presence of God, remind them who God is, remind them of the big picture, the big God, what is ironic, I'm getting ahead of myself, we'll touch back, go back one screen please, Carolyn. Our words have power. Be careful. Because God will either give us what we say, or He will, in dramatic irony, something else. Our wives, our little ones, will become a prey. They will die here in the wilderness. A little while later, when God says, fine, I won't kill you, but you're going to wander in the wilderness 40 years, one year for every day the spies were in the land, and the only ones that will not die in the wilderness are your little ones. They're the ones that are going in. It's pretty powerful when you start to think about it. God took their words and said, no, my word, not yours. And so it's something to look at. So, and then 6 to 10, we have Caleb speaks up. Uh, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. The Lord delights in us. He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Verses 9 and 10. Only do not rebel against the Lord. We go, well, I just don't have much faith right now. They said, that is rebellion. God has told you to do something and He's told you to trust Him and you're not. You are rebelling against the Lord. Faithlessness is serious. Do not fear the people of the land for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone with the stones but the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. 
This is okay, theater. Both are presented and it's a choice. What are you going to choose? What do they keep saying? They don't say, you know, it's like it was like David when he faced Goliath. David didn't go, I'm the man, I am the dude. I have practiced my sleep forever. I am the best. I hold 12 national championships with stone throwing. You know, no, he said, the same God that delivered to me the wild animals that sought to prey on my father's sheep, that same God is going to give that giant to me. God said, okay, but the Lord will deliver them. The Lord will let them. The Lord will go with The Lord's going to do this for us. And it's, it's something that is so important. And I know, you know, I know in my life, I see so many of mirrors of these fears that come in when I face a situation. And I have to just kind of go back and say, okay, but what does God say? Well, who is my God? What promises does he have for me in this moment? What is he saying about this moment? And, and to do this, and something that, I wonder if I could find the verse. You have it, Carolyn, something. I want to find Carolyn, somewhere down farther, you should have Joshua 2, 8 to 11. I'm skipping here, but. So, when they do enter in later, 40 years later, right? Joshua, Caleb, go in, they go to the sea, they, they send their spies, Rahab takes them. You know, I'm not going to go into that story too much. You can read it, but she hides the spies. Listen to what she told them about going back to this day. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. Forty years ago, we heard about this. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, the Sinai of whom you devoted to destruction. One more verse, I think. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. What is she saying? She's saying back when you crossed the Red Sea and you did it and God protected you in the wilderness before you got to the Jordan the first time. We have heard what God has done for you and we have melted in fear and been waiting for you to cross that river because we know that you will and you're going to take us. Since we heard it 40 years before. Now if you could, Carolyn, go back to Joshua and Caleb's words. Please. And that would have been uh, 6 to 10. Uh, 14, number 14, 6 to 10. If the Lord delights us, he will bring us next screen, please. No. Nine and ten. Do not fear the people. They are bred. Their protection is removed from them. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. You go over to Rahab 40 years later, 40 plus, and she's saying, we were melting in our boots back then. They were ready to be taken. The land was prepped. The people, the fear had already gone ahead of the people of God. But they did not have faith to step into that victory. And that's something I think for us to really be careful of as Christians. God has done work. And yet so much of what he died for is unredeemed. Because the body of Christ does not step out into that victory and drive the battle into the face of the enemy. We go into defensive mode, I think, so often and just hope we kind of don't mess up too bad until heaven comes or Jesus comes back and says, say no. But the indignation of David, they were God's people, indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, covered in the blood of Jesus who defeated darkness, who removed us from the authority of darkness. No. No. Moses intercedes because God just gets so tired of the people. I'm going to put a plague on them. I'm going to pick a new people. And Moses said, no, Lord, please don't. He, he begs before the people. And God agrees to spare the people. 
But that's when he says, but not one in this generation, Joshua and Caleb, will enter that land. The children will. But you will wander 40 years in the wilderness for one year for every day the spies were in the land. Do you think God's, our response to fear versus faith is important to God? Those spies that I told you to send in were in 40 days, so for one year, for every day. They brought back to you fear, fear and they brought back faith. They told you what was possible. They told you this is a land flowing with milk and honey. The fruit is so big, two men have to carry practically a bunch of grapes. It's yours, because I told you it is. But you got to go get it. I'll be with you. I'll deliver it into your hand. And, and I, I know it's so easy to stand up here and preach this, and it can be so hard for that. I have gone into times when I have prayed for something I just so confident. This is not God's desire. This is not in. I mean, I just, and I did not see the deliverance or the healing I fully expected, or it's discouraging. It is. I, I understand that. I've come to places, I've told Marianne, I said, you pray for him, nothing happens when I do. You know? Um, and she'll remind me, but you know what? A whole lot more people are prayed than if you hadn't prayed at all. You know, I think of a, a lady we had heard about, was a prophetic word was given that she would see blind eyes open when she prayed. And she prayed for a hundred people first 99 it never happened and on the hundredth person it did and it's happened so much now that when they go into villages in Africa Heidi Baker when they go into villages in Africa the very first thing they will do is say bring us your deaf and bring us your blind and they just pray and as eyes open and ears open the people go okay you're the big, the big cheese tell us what you want to tell us because they've seen God on display. I'm not trying to say, you know, it's so easy to say, God's won the victory, go out and just do it, you know, but, and then you pray and nothing happens, or, the, you know, the person still died, or whatever. It's so easy to get discouraged and to start to doubt God's words or water his words down. We are children of the King. The victory was won by the blood of Christ. And we walk in it. Yes, the land needs occupying. Yes, there are casualties. We keep the big picture in mind. We have eternity. Sometimes, like in Joshua Caleb's case, they did nothing wrong. Their promise from God was delayed 40 years because of other people they depended on. And that's where the body of Christ, each doing what it's supposed to do, being who it's called to be, is so important. It may not mean much to you, but someone else's life or future may be depending on your choice whether or not to walk in obedience. Whether or not to choose faith, because we are one body, the body of Christ. If Christ is the head, we are the body, each individual members of it, but one body. The last thing that I want to just mention, and then we'll begin next week with looking at the different spirit that Caleb had. What was it that made him different? How did he look at things? Because God will say, Caleb has a different spirit. And we'll, so we'll take a look at that, maybe, what that might look like. Because I don't know about you, but I want that spirit. I want to be the one that enters into that victory. But the last thing I want to say is the people survived. God clothed them, fed them, took care of them. They did not see the fullness of what was available to them. But they were still taken care of by God because of the intercession of Moses. He interceded before God for the people. And I want to leave you with three verses. Romans 8, 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding?
for us. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, an attorney, an interceder with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Hebrews 7, 25. Consequently, he, Christ, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. At every moment of your life, Christ is seated at the right hand of his Father, interceding for you. Christ is bringing your name. He is bringing you before the Father constantly. He is constantly advocating on your behalf, interceding, Father, those are mine. Father, they love them. Father, I died for them. Father, those are mine. They're my friends. They're my bride. Constantly. Always lives to make intercession. You mess up, there's Jesus going. You know, Satan, the accuser, is going, Did you see that? Huh? And Satan's going, Yeah, just see them. I mean, Jesus, I love them. They're mine. Mine. I died for them. They're covered in my blood, my righteousness. They're mine. If the intercession of Moses moves the heart of God, how much more the intercession of the Son for you. I hope that's encouraging to you as you walk out the door and you go through this week knowing that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, continually bringing you before the Father's remembrance, speaking on your behalf. Because he is absolutely Christ in that. He loves you so, so much. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for your love, Father, and your goodness, your presence with us, your victory that we walk in. And I ask that you strengthen us, Lord. Help us to see that big picture, Holy Spirit. Awaken us to visions of you and your holiness and your majesty and your might, Lord. That we would bring it all in perspective. as we stand before that bunker hill, we would see the Rockies and the Sierras behind them. That we would just have that perspective, Lord, that keeps the big picture, it keeps your might at the forefront of our sight. That we would have the spirit of Joshua and Caleb that would trust you over all appearance. That the faith of Sarah and Abraham. And I thank you for the gentleness of your words, your scripture, Lord, that we, it doesn't just say Abraham and Sarah were mighty faith people, but shows us their journey to faith. To encourage us to walk the road, too. I thank you that what is available to the heroes of your faith, our faith, that same is available to you and I, to us, Lord. And I thank you for that. And I ask you, Lord, to protect us this week, give us divine appointments, let us be sensitive to your spirit, fill us with your joy as we choose to focus on you. And I thank you and ask this in Jesus' name.